Li Zhao, uh, telling us about her latest work. And I asked her to give a little bit of review of her past work, some of which uh, she did with our uh, Dharma large eddy simulation model here, which um, originated at University of Washington, the dynamics for that model. And she showed some, she came to look at this, uh, even though she was a student at McGill, uh, partly because Andy has um, a lot of facility with that model. And he was able to help her pursue her interest in uh, studying the development of a mesoscale structure in uh, precipitating and non-precipitating stratocumulus. And she had a specific uh, objective of showing, or you know, she was pursuing the idea that in precipitating stratocumulus, the canonical uh, um, uh, I, canonical concept that the mesoscale structure is set by the cold pools in it that are formed from the evaporating precipitation was not actually correct. And actually the uh, thermodynamic uh, profile and the profile of moisture within the boundary layer um, was actually uh, the de a determining factor. And therefore the cold pools were, it's not to say they don't lead to updrafts around them, but they're not determinant of the structure. So I'll let her correct me on all of this summary in a moment, hopefully. <laughs> but then she went on um, after working with us on uh, that uh, problem. We uh, wrote a paper together. She went to a postdoc working with uh, Chris Brotherton at University of Washington, where she rounded out the work with a study of non-drizzling stratocumulus. And there we don't have cold pools, essentially, that are because we don't have the precipitation for, uh, formation that leads to evaporation that leads to cold pools. And she uh, basically... Uh, showed that the uh, st that the the pronounced mesoscale structure that we nonetheless see in non precipitating stratocumulus is controlled by the cloud top uh, cloud top cooling, which essentially leads to direct circulations of cold air, essentially uh, rolling downhill off the tops of clouds. Um, and so these, she's gone on to uh, do satellite studies and has been working uh, in Graham Feingold's group now with the SAM model. And I will let her take it from here. So I'm really curious to hear more, Shelley. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction, Anne, and, and thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. I am Shelley from NOAA Series, and I'm very happy today to share with you my studies related to the shallow cloud mesoscale organization and its interaction with aerosols. I'll be specifically focusing on the warm cloud. So the importance of marine boundary layer cloud can't be stressed enough. They strongly reflect the solar radiation back to space and also they're ubiquitous, especially over subtropics and mid latitudes, as you can see from the map here. Although the stratocumulus cloud have high cloud coverage, but they frequently, they are not spatially hom homogeneous. They are actually frequently observed in an organized texture on mesoscale in the form of mesoscale cellular convection, as you can see from the right. So now I am showing you two typical mesoscale uh, cellular types, the closed cells and open cells and their respective frequency of occurrence. The open cells tends to form over warmer ocean or with reduced cloud drop number concentration that facilitate precipitation. The size of the cells for both types can range from 10 to 80 kilometers or even larger. I see the mesoscale cellular convection as one of the important missing pieces in the cloud climate research. And another challenging frontier is the aerosol cloud interaction. So to better constrain the cloud feedback and aerosol indirect radiative forcing, it is very important for us to have a better understanding of these two elements and how they interact with each other. Today, I'll be focusing on mesoscale cellular convection, MCC here. I'll be talking about how MCCs develop and broaden. What is the role of precipitation in the development of MCC? Is there any observational constraints on MCC? And whether the MCC cloud structure would have an, uh, any impact on the aerosol cloud interactions? I'll be covering all these four topics in today's talk. Let's start with the MCC development. The mesoscale cellular convective clouds were first observed um, in early 1960s with the start of satellite era. Since then, the influence on MCCs have become clearer. 
thanks to the observations and LDS modeling studies. For example, there is a comprehensive in-situ observational studies during the MTEX field campaign where there is a research flight that traverse the closed cells in the cloud layer and below the cloud layer and measured uh, the horizontal perturbations on mesoscale of humidity, temperature, and wind speed. And they found that the cloudiest region on mesoscale is actually 10 to 20% moisture than the least cloudy regions. So this is consistent with the conceptual um, circulation pattern that I'm showing you here in yellow, which is in the center of the clouds, there's updrafts and uh, uh, near the cloud edge, there is a downdraft that brings uh, dry free tropospheric air down to the boundary layer. Apart from the observational studies, um, the earliest modeling studies have been really helpful for, uh, for us to uh, identify the critical um, influence on the mesoscale cellular convections. For example, how to reproduce the big um, mesoscale cellular convec convective clouds aspect ratio. The typical aspect ratio for that in nature is about 10 to 30. But if you, uh, in the dry convection simulations, the aspect ratio is only two to six, which is way smaller. However, by adding an artificial layer of radiative cooling at the top of the boundary layer, the scale of the circulation is found to increase significantly. And later on, Schrute et al. examined the moist convection and they found that the scale of the circulation increased even larger and is close to what, what is observed. So clearly, as you can see, um, the, convect, uh, the development, of, uh, development and broadening of the mesoscale cellular convection is actually a convective process. And the cloud top radiative cooling and latent heating play very important roles here. So what so now the question becomes, what is the role of the cloud top radiative cooling in driving the mesoscale cellular convection? It is uh, a little bit counterintuitive here because the cloud top cooling occurs on the in the center of the cells um, where there is supposed to have updraft motion, as you can see from this uh, um, yellow sketch here. But the radiative cooling tends to drive the air downward. And similarly, near the cloud edge, um, the, uh, there is a downdraft, there's supposed to be a downdraft motion that brings the dry uh, free tropospheric air down to the boundary layer. However, this warm uh, free tropospheric air tends to have a positive buoyancy that goes against these circulations. So how can we reconcile this? there seems to be a temperature and moisture dilemma. And another uh, missing piece here is for the drizzling cells, which has reduced the cloud water, which means their cloud top radiative cooling is weak, then how the cells develop in this context? To understand this, we perform alias simulations using DAMA um, of stratocumus cloud configured to DICOMS to RF O2 case. And the detailed configuration is on the right. I'll leave it there. So the um, point here is that we prescribe uh, the early simulations with a range of cloud drop number concentrations to cover the cases from non drizzling to moderate drizzling. And for simplicity, we apply a nudging approach to guarantee a constant inversion level throughout the simulations. Now let's start with the non-precipitating um, clouds. What you see here is an animation of the pseudo albedo for the non-precipitation um, simulation that we have. It's pseudo because we do um, nocturnal simulations. And what you see here is that the simulation starts with a ho homogeneous cloud layer in the beginning. But once the simulation starts, turbulence kicks in and the clouds breaks into very small scales dominated by the boundary layer turbulence. But then you will see how the cloud grows with time. 
At hour 60, the cloud has already grown to the size of the domain, as you can see on the right. So to better understand the role of cloud top radium cooling, we did a, an additional simulation where we horizontally homogenized the radiative fluxes at each time step. So um, just a note, in the baseline, we also have, uh, we also have uh, radiative cooling, and it, but it's unaltered. We didn't do anything to change that. You can see in this uh, simulation with horizontally homogenized uh, radio flux, the cloud scales does not grow after hour 10. It remains very small. So this suggests that the cloud radiation interaction here is really important in cell development and the latent heating itself cannot support that. To better understand the cloud radiation interaction, Let's take a look at the cell structure here in a composite framework. What you see here is a composite string function in the directions of altitude on the y-axis and sorted total water pass on the x-axis. So on the right, you see the moist regions and uh, on the left is the dry regions. Looking at this uh, figure, you see a well-defined counterclockwise circulation within the boundary layer. Uh, the inversion top is defined as uh, it is, is shown as in a black solid line, and the cloud base is shown in the dash dotted line here. So you see that there is a mesoscale updrafts in the moist columns where the clouds are thicker. And then there's mesoscale downdrafts in the dry columns where the clouds are thinner. I've put a schematic here for you to understand intuitively. So now let's zoom in to the top of the boundary layer. You see that right above the inversion layer, which is shown again by the black solid line here, the free tropospheric air converge toward um, uh, the moist regions. And then once it reached the moist regions, it is then sliding down um, the sloping inversion towards the dry columns. So that's, that's the pattern at the cloud top. Now, if I overlay these streamlines with mesoscale radiative heating anomalies, which is shown in color, back, in colored background, so the blue color here uh, is the radiative heating, uh, radiative cooling anomalies. It is very interesting to see that the radiative cooling aligns very well with the streamline here. So this is telling us that um, the radiative cooling is consistently cooling the free tropospheric air as it is sliding down uh, uh, the sloping inversion. And by the time um, when it gets to the dry regions and the cloud edge, the air is already cold and dry instead of warm and dry when it was in the free troposphere. So to test this hypothesis, we uh, look at the mesoscale buoyancy anomalies. Sorry. We look at the mesoscale buoyancy anomalies in the entire boundary layer. So you can see that the mesoscale buoyancy anomalies uh, is positive for the entire boundary layer in the moist columns, especially in the cloud layers, which drives this mesoscale circulation. And the positive buoyancy below the cloud layer tends to accelerate the mesoscale updrafts. To partition these buoyancy terms into two terms, moist conserved buoyancy, which is basically the buoyancy outside of cloud and rain, we can actually see the impact of the radiative cooling here from this term. And another term would be the latent heat, uh, the buoyancy coming from the latent heating, which will only occur in the cloud layer. So looking at these two terms separately, you see that in our baseline case, um, both the moist conserved buoyancy and latent heating buoyancy anomalies are positive in the moist regions and negative in the dry regions, which supports the development of the mesoscale circulation. Now let's compare that to the simulation of, of homo homogenized radiative fluxes. You can see that for the latent heating distribution, um, 
it is very similar to the baseline case that we that I just showed. However, for the moist conserved buoyancy terms, in this homogenized radiative flux simulation, it is basically reversed in the boundary layer. This is because in this simulation, uh, the cloud operative cooling does not align with the um, airflow, does not align with the streamline anymore. So there, there is a, 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 a missing feedback, important missing feedback here that, that drives this mesoscale circulation. And therefore, the net buoyancy fluxes is very, very uh, weak for this uh, simulation of homogenized radiative fluxes that basically hampers the development of mesoscale circulation. So now let me conclude. There is no temperature and moisture dilemma here. The reason is because the radiative cooling aligns very well with the airflow when uh, the free tropospheric air is flowing um, uh, along the inversion. And by the time the air gets to the cloud edge and it becomes cold and dry instead of warm and dry. So this cold air supports the down downdraft and supports these buoyancy forces that amplify the mesoscale circulation. But what for the drizzling cells that does not have uh, a lot of cloud water, so the cloud top, the cloud top radiative cooling is um, not that strong. I would like to, uh, I would like to drive your attention to the figure on the right where I I'm showing you the temporal evolution of the cloud scales for the three drizzling simulations that we have. And you can see that the case with the lowest cloud water and the least cloud top radiative cooling, which is the red line here that represent the case of the lowest cloud drop number concentration and the most uh, precipitation. You can see that this case actually has the largest um, cloud scale um, throughout the simulations. So apparently precipitation is playing a role here, but what's that role? A well-known oscillating cellular convection theory suggests that for cells that are strongly precipitating, the cold pools would, collide, it would diverge and then collide with the neighboring cold pools to trigger the new convection forming at the, at the border of the cells. So that is basically one of the hypothesis, hypothesis that is dynamic response to the uh, evaporative cooling of drizzle. But if you think about it thermodynamically, the drizzle evaporation can also lead to a moisture stratification that would bring more air, uh, bring more water vapor into the cloud, which will promote additional latent heating from condensation that will also help to drive this circulation. So in order to test the role of light and moderate drilling cases, we run two additional um, uh, simulations, um, one with no vertical moisture gradient, which means we make sure that the horizontal average of uh, total water remains the same vertically within the boundary layer. As you can see from the right, there is no moisture stratification. And another simulation that we run is we turn off precipitation evaporation. Um, so in both of these additional simulations, um, there is no moisture stratification. And in the simulation where we turn off precipitation evaporation, there is also no cold pool for an apparent reason. As you can see, more clearly from um, the three bottom figures here, which shows the subcloud buoyancy at uh, about 100 meters for these three cases. And you can see that the simulation with no precipitation evaporation, there is basically no, uh, the buoyancy is very weak at, in the subcloud layer. But I also want to draw your attention to uh, the first two simulations. You can see directly, that the cold pool strength seems to be very similar between these two simulations. However, in the simulations where there is no vertical moisture gradient, 
the cloud scale is much smaller. So this suggests to us that the dynamic response of the drizzle evaporate, evaporate cooling is really not the controlling factors for the cell development. Instead, the raindrop evaporation increases the cloud scales by increasing the moisture stratification. So more cloud water into the, more water vapor into the cloud, more latent heating that also supports um, the amplification and development of the cells. However, the uh, mesoscale cells will not grow forever. With the increase of the cell size, there, uh, the TKE will reside more in the, ver in the horizontal than in the vertical. So this means that uh, with the increase of the cell size, the boundary layer becomes more decoupled and less effective in supplying moisture to the cloud. Here is a short summary of the first two topics. We found that cell broadening is induced by long wave radiative cooling of air sinking down sloping clouds. And for light and moderate straddling clouds, raindrop evaporation increases cloud scales by increasing moisture stratification. Now that we know that uh, the cell, excuse me, now that we know that the cell scale may grow depending on its own historical evolution. But is there also a dependence of cell scale on the environmental conditions? To look for observational constraints on mesoscale cellular convection, we try to find answers from satellite observations. First of all, we need a tool to classify the mesoscale cells by their cell sizes. So here we use 2D wavelet analysis on the measurement, direct measurements of liquid water paths from satellite-based microwave radiometer M3E. We think that 2D wavelet analysis is superior to the conventional Fourier analysis because it's less noisy and it's computationally much simpler. And if you think of 2D wavelet analysis as a band path filter, then the advantage of that is it can partition a spatial field into local fluctuations at different octaves. By octaves, I mean uh, uh, it's an octave range, but here I'm using the weighted average of their wavelengths range um, for simplicity. So I'm showing you an example here in the bottom. On the left, you see the original liquid pass field. And using the wavelet analysis, this field can be partitioned into liquid paths fluctuations um, at different octaves from 20 kilometers to 160 kilometers. The octave range depends on the spatial resolution of the measurements and also the size of the domain. And then we would like to use this to tell us the cell scale. To do that, um, so we basically define the cell scales as the wavelengths where the variance is the greatest, which is basically um, 80 kilometers. So what this means, this means that the liquid water pass um, uh, variability is the strongest at these wavelengths. And we, we, we use that wavelength as, um, as a proxy for the cell scale. If you look at these uh, uh, liquid water pass fluctuations at 80 kilometers, you see that the pattern looks very similar to the pattern of the original liquid water pass. Um, so it is working very well. Now we have a good method that um, can help us classify the cells by their cell sizes. I then collect data from three Stratocum cloud intense regions, Northeast Pacific, Southeast Pacific, and Southeast Atlantic, um, and try to see if, uh, if there is any connection for our cells of different sizes with environmental conditions. We look at the boundary layer heights, sea surface temperature, estimated inversion strengths, and wind speed for both closed and open cells. And X axis here is the cloud scale. As you might already notice, uh, we don't see, at least from this uh, study, we don't see an ob obvious dependence of cell scale on the environmental controlling factors. 
So this suggests to us that the cell scale may depend more on its own historical e e evolution than the current environmental conditions. But you might also notice that the data is a little bit noisy here. So I think more work needs to be done to classify these cases into more small categories, for example, different seasons, different locations, to see if we can find any signals that is statistically significant. So now we've talked a lot, a lot about uh, how the, uh, the size of the cells change um, uh, uh, with time and with uh, environmental conditions, let's take a look at how these uh, mesoscale cell sizes impact the aerosol cloud interactions. For that, I use seven years of MODIS and series data over North Atl Atlantic region. Of course, this can be extended to other stratocumulus cloud heavy regions. The idea here is I divide this region into two degrees by two degrees scenes. And I'm currently focusing only on the high cloud coverage stratocumulus cloud, which is closed cells. I'm using 2D wavelet analysis again to classify the cells by their cell sizes. But here I'm using high, uh, high spatial resolution modis liquid pass retrievals. So I classify uh, the cells into four octaves from eight kilometers to 64 kilometers. The majority of the cells fall into this category. Sorry, it's the light. <laughs> so now I'm showing you the example scenes of modis liquid pass at different cell sizes classified by the 2D wavelet analysis from eight kilometers to 64 kilometers. And you can see that the wavelet analysis is actually doing a quite good job. And I found in total about 6,000 cases during these seven years. To touch upon um, the uh, aerosol cloud interactions, I look at the response of liquid pass to the change in cloud drop number concentration across cell sizes. So here, I basically consider the in-cloud scene average uh, cloud drop number concentration as a proxy for the surrounding aerosols. So I try to link the in-cloud scene average liquid pass with the in-cloud scene average cloud drop number concentration together. For example, for each scene, um, we get these two average values and that contributes to this one point in the domain of liquid pass and cloud drop number concentration. And remember, I have almost 6,000 cases. So I collect all this data and to see the trend and here is what I have. The different colors here indicate the cells of different sizes. And the dots here uh, is the medium liquid pass in 10% percentile beans of cloud drop in number concentration. You notice the black dotted line here, which is actually a theoretical line of uh, when the effective radius of cloud droplets equals 14 micron. And we consider that as a proxy for the precipitation onset. So on the left hand side of this uh, black dotted line, the cells are primarily precipitating. And on the right hand side of this line, the, the cells are primarily not, not precipitating. So we pay specific in, uh, uh, attention to the liquid water pass adjustment slope which is basically the slope in this figure that is defined as the change in the quarter pass to the change in cloud drop in number concentration, which is a proxy for aerosols. And you see that uh, the liquid water pass adjustment slope is overall negative for cells of uh, all different scales. And especially for the cells of non-precipitating clouds, which is on the right-hand side of this dotted line here. So this suggests to us that the negative slope here is driven by the entrainment drying. Physically, it means that with the increase of cloud drop number concentration, with all else being equal, then the size of the cloud droplets will become smaller, uh, which will weaken the sedimentation and increase the surface area of the cloud droplets, and both of which facilitate the entrainment at the cloud top. But the interesting thing here is that 
it seems like the entrainment drying efficiency is quite different the cells of different scales. The slope is significantly less negative for large size cells. For example, uh, the red and the green lines here. And we think there are potentially two reasons for that dynamically, because large scale cells tends to be more decoupled as I discussed before. So it is associated with less entrainment. And microphysically, which is something that I'm not show, show you here, is large scale, uh, large scale cells tends to have bigger cloud droplets, which is, which is associated with less evaporation again. So I, we think that's probably the reason that explains the difference in the entrainment and drying efficiency and also the difference in the liquid pass adjustment slope. The difference here in slope can be as big as seven times, so it's quite big. And we believe that this difference should reflect in the cloud albedo as well. So we take a look at the cloud albedo susceptibility using the same framework. The cloud albedo susceptibility is defined as the change of cloud albedo to the change in um, cloud drop number concentration. Again, the slope in this figure. The cloud albedo is computed by the measurements of series. So you might notice why the, the, the relation here is a little bit noisy for small scale cells. That is because the series footprint resolution, which is about 0.2 degree, is closer than the scales of eight kilometers and 16 kilometers. But overall, you can see the trend here. The overall cloud albedo stability trend is positive. This means that with the increase of cloud drop the number concentration, there will be increase of cloud albedo. This suggests that the Tumi effect dominates. Physically, it means that with the increase of cloud droplet number concentration, then the cloud size, droplet size will become smaller and the clouds will become brighter and uh, uh, reflect the solar radiation, radiation back to the space even more strongly. However, you do see that the, the slope here for clouds of different sizes are very, are very different. For the large scale size, the cloud albedo susceptibility can be three times uh, greater than that of the small scale um, cells. This is mainly because the large scale cells doesn't have a lot of negative cloud water adjustment. So they increase the, the cloud albedo uh, faster with the increase in uh, aerosols. So a short um, summary for this topic, mesoscale cell size plays a important role in regulating the aerosol induced brightness via the cloud water adjustment. So we think it has important implications for the aerosol indirect radiative forcing. As you might notice, uh, the last topic we've done, it, it's just we've done uh, 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 some early work and there is still a lot to, need to be learned to understand the aerosol cloud interaction in the context of um, cloud organization. So Anne and I are thinking of combining observations, LDS and single column models together to link the aerosol cloud interaction with cloud organization and the cloud water variability, which is basically a proxy for uh, the cloud organization in the single column models. So that's the future direction. And that concludes my talk for today. And I'll leave my summaries here for the four topics and I'll I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jelly. Um, that was fantastic. Do any questions from the room here? And then we should look online. Um... I, I just have one. Why, why would you pick the North Atlantic to, to study these clouds? <laughs> that's a great question, and that's for historical reason because I was on the uh, DOE arm proposal at that time, so I had to use that region. But um, 
you are totally right. I will, I, I should look at other regions and especially um, Southeast Pacific, I think where the cloud organization patterns is uh, uh, most significant there. So are you looking at the area around the Azores site? Is that, yes. Sorry, what, what was the question? You're looking at the area around the Azores site. Yes. Um, you showed there's an importance to have uh, entrainment cooling that's heterogeneous. And I'm assuming in the model it's computed in one dimensional radio transfer. Do you think the answer might change again if you use three dimensional radio transfer? Um, I think three dimensional radio transfer would be super important for uh, cloud regimes of uh, smaller cloud fraction, for example, Cumulus Cloud, where you have a lot of lateral entrainment. Um, but here, uh, because I'm looking at uh, Stratocumus Cloud, which are basically um, overcast cloud. So I cannot, I, I, I do not know for sure, but I would uh, assume that the, the, the uh, 1D rate of transfer would be enough for that. Any other questions online? I don't want to jump in yet. <laughs> no questions okay. online. Okay, great. Shelly, I wonder about the use of liquid water path and the liquid water path retrievals. We've um, been in working in, in our work with uh, Activate, for instance, we've been seeing a pretty big difference across some of the products. And, um, and you know, the total, you know, it's a little, we understand from Greg Elsacer's work that the total liquid water path is, you know, which, which arguably microwave instruments, as I understand it, are more sensitive as there's kind of an ad hoc adjustment to remove whatever rain may be there. It's, I wonder if you had thought much about that or if, if you um, had tried, you know, using albedo or any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I use both. I use the uh, direct measurements of liquid water paths from the m 3 e um, for one of my studies. And um, yes, we did some corrections to separate the cloud water paths uh, versus uh, rainwater paths. So there are uncertainties there for sure. And in another study, I used a modus retrieved um, liquid water paths. Um, so I didn't do any uh, detailed comparison of liquid water paths here, but I uh, the, I would say the advantage of the MODIS retrieved liquid water paths is it has higher spatial resolution. Um, so the spatial resolution for the MODIS is one kilometer versus m e is about 10 kilometer. So, um, the, so the MODIS uh, liquid water paths will be helpful for um, for understanding the the uh, the mesoscale cloud organization, I think. How does that retrieval work? Uh, I'm actually not. Is that uh, taking optical depth and? It's the retrieved based on optical depth and effective radius of cloud droplets. So it's basically the uh, the the uh, um, uh, optical de depths multiply the effective radius. It's related to the product of that. I see. Be mechanic. I see. I see. So that assumes a. Does that assume an, an effective radius profile then? Is it, but what is it? It's not going to be McKinney pass, right? It's just a short wave infrared and visible. It's uh -huh. you effective radius and optical depth, and then everything else has you have to have a model for it, right? Uh huh. So it's like an eighty percent adiabatic lapse rate or something. Probably yeah, probably. we have to do some assumption. Yes. Okay, okay. All right. Um, well, I mean, along those lines, I'm, you get all these artifacts when you have broken clouds of drop of concentrations and everything. But uh, do you do you take do you worry about the fact that the more broken clouds you have, the less you can believe drop of concentration retrieval? Um, that the broken cloud is certainly a problem for the cloud of the number concentra uh, concentration retrievals. So the way that uh, we're currently uh, use is to set a threshold of uh, optical depth and effective radius. For example, I only use uh, the cloud of the number concentration retrievals when the uh, optical depth, cloud op optical depth is greater than three, um, just to make sure that the retrieval is robust. 
Um, but certainly, if the cloud scenes is broken, then uh, the retrievals is uh, less trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So I have kind of an, a naive question, Jelly. Have you thought, are you able to use the simulations you showed in the first part of your talk to see if they reproduce the susceptibility conclude or you know support the susceptibility conclusions from that you got directly from observations? Yeah, that could be. Um, yes. Um, so like I said, uh, the the uh, cloud aerosol interaction uh, in the uh, uh, cloud organization. What I've done is just some early work, and there are certainly a lot of directions. And um, yeah, combining the um, uh, earlier simulations and put aerosol perturbations would be a very good way to um, look at it. Yeah, that'd be a really nice pathway to you know considering a parameterization um, in our single column model, for instance, just testing something simple. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's really neat. Um, okay, is there unless there's more questions, uh, any other discussion? Uh, we looks like we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, people that are online, if you want, you could unmute yourselves, ask a question, or throw it in the chat. Um, All if, right. Yeah, if not, I think. We can wrap it up. Okay, great. And I want to mention that Zhao Li comes to town periodically. And so um, if anyone wants to get in touch with her, there's her, her email address. And uh, I have enjoyed many interesting discussions. <laughs> so I can I can recommend meeting with her. So thanks so much, Zhao Li. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. I'll log off here.